Hi everyone and welcome to OR Today webinars. We have a great presentation for you today to discuss industry questions that are often answered incorrectly or poorly. Today's analysis will include the following expert panelists. Seth Hendy, Clinical Education Specialist. John Wieland, Clinical Education Specialist. Jahan Azizi, Special Projects Manager. And Kevin Anderson, Clinical Education Specialist. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, Healthmark Industries. Since 1969, Healthmark Industries has developed and marketed innovative solutions to aid healthcare facilities in their delivery of surgical instruments and other life-saving medical devices to patients. Healthmark Industries' mission is to continue to innovate, continue to support, and continue to serve the healthcare provider industry and support services that make it possible to deliver healthcare, quality healthcare. Please visit hmark.com for more information. For nearly 20 years, OR Today has provided perioperative and SPD professionals with up-to-date news and information about their profession, including new guidelines, techniques, and equipment, as well as practical information for career building, problem solving, and overall well-being. Please visit ortoday.com to sign up for your free subscription. Today's webinar is eligible for continuing education credits by either the State of California Board of Registered Nursing or the Certi Certification Board for Sterile Processing and Distribution. You can obtain your certificate by completing today's post-webinar survey, and you may select which credit you would like to receive at that time. More details on this at the end of today's webinar. We'll wrap up today's presentation with a live Q&A. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar by using the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. We'll get through as many questions as time allows. Now I'll turn it over to our panelists. Seth, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thanks, Jennifer. Here's just a quick quick little thing we put at all beginning of all of our presentations. It's Healthmark's policy and philosophy. And really, I, I usually sum it up by just reading the last sentence. An educated customer is our best customer. And we really do try to go out and provide excellent products, excellent customer service, and excellent education to go along with those products. And that's really our, our core policy and our core philosophy when it comes to our products and customers. Objectives for our programs today. Uh, we had sat around and thought, hey, you know, sometimes we see some really poor answers to what are actually great questions. And, and that's really kind of the genesis behind this thing. And so our objectives are going to be to discuss those important topics uh, to device processing. Uh, they get incorrectly discussed in, in public arenas like social media and, and things like that. Um, and then to really try to provide correct answers to those questions because they are good questions. So we wanna make sure that we're given good answers. I get to start, so we'll start with me. Uh, the, the good question that I hear a lot is, should my washer be able to pass a test made by a company other than the equipment manufacturer? That, that's a good question. Uh, the problem is we get this bad answer all the time. Nope, if it passes, if it passes our test, then it doesn't need to pass any other test. That's really a short-sighted kind of answer, and, and it's really not true. So let's talk about what the good answer is and, and where that comes from. So the good answer is, yes, it should. Uh, if the test is appropriate for the equipment uh, and used per the IFU, then, the, then a washer should be able to pass it. So someone who says, well, it doesn't have to pass any other test than mine is really kind of lowering the bar for their, for their piece of equipment. Uh, if the equipment is marketed uh, properly uh, and functioning properly, it should be able to perform performance qualification. And so that's where this, this kind of first thought comes from. That's what we do uh, with our devices, with our, with our equipment is perform performance qualification. And so straight from SC79, PQ is a process of obtaining and documenting evidence 
that equipment as installed and operated in accordance with operational procedures consistently performs in accordance with predetermined criteria and thereby yields product meeting its specifications. Now that's um, that's a wordy way of saying that we're, we're making sure the washer does what it says it's supposed to do. Now I did say washer, but the reason this is so wordy is it's going to be different uh, for an ultrasonic, let's say, and it could, could be different for a cart washer, unless that cart washer is used as an instrument washer, and then it should be the same as an instrument washer, right? That's, that's what we're doing. That's what we're trying to drill down to here is what is an appropriate test? Well, it depends on the equipment, and if the equipment and the tests are appropriate, then they should pass. Uh, verification tests for mechanical washers, uh, and they give a little, this is, this is again from SD79, tests for soil removal. Since I used washers when I first started my question, I'll stick with that. And what do we want washers to do? Well, we like them to remove soil. Uh, and through an indication is a visual assessment or absence of a marker on a coupon placed in a washer. So Amy, ST79 is not getting specific in saying this company's washer with this company's test. They're saying, are you, do you have a way of visually assessing or looking for the absence of a marker on a coupon? So that again tells you, Amy thinks of this as a much broader thing and no, it's not specific to an OEM. Here's a little more to, to keep that going. And, and, and again, straight straight from the standards, if, you, if you're wondering where this, this guidance comes from and where you can go to look, that, that's where it comes from. Uh, medical device manufacturers should be familiar with cleaning and disinfection and sterilization technologies used in healthcare facilities and with the kinds of soil and microbial contamination uh, encountered as a result of patient use. So I put this in here because you should be thinking to yourself, well, okay, what do I really want my washer to do? Uh, and if you're interested in having your washer remove blood from stainless steel, then seeking out um, a, a product or, or, or a, a test that can prove that and can show that and you document it means that the rest of your processing should go as well, right? That's what, that's what we hope. Um, and, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this back to blood because I actually, this is one of my favorite quotes, a little, little gory, but it's one of my favorite quotes from SC79 because it really gets you to think. We could have many types of soil, but as a liquid, blood tends to flow over and into joints, hinges, grooves, and other difficult to uh, clean locations. It then coagulates and dries to create a challenge to cleaning. So there we go. Now, it does say that other things, other fluids, body fats, carbohydrates, there are other things present, but blood does present a particular challenge when, when it dries. So when you're, when you're seeking a test, you should be thinking to yourself, okay, I should be able to use any test, uh, but I wanna find a test that correlates most appropriately to the things that I'm trying to get cleaned. And, and if you do that and your washer passes that test, you should feel uh, good about your, your next subsequent load, right? And through the rest of the day, and then we test it again tomorrow. And that is the good answer to that good question. And now we will go to Kevin. Uh, Kevin, so I'll, I'll read your question. We'll, we'll hand them off that way. Um, sure. So uh, why run a TOSI in an ultrasonic? All right, Seth, thank you. Uh, so this is a question that actually came up in a social media discussion on LinkedIn, and it is a good question. Uh, and you see here on the slide what I believe was kind of the bad answer, as it were. It's, it just simply stated a TOSI test is not the best indicator of sonic energy. Now, in all honesty, a TOSI test is not really meant to test for sonic energy or cavitation, as we call it. So this isn't a completely bad answer. It is an incomplete answer to a very good question. And we'll further explain uh, uh, as we move on to the next slide here. Um, so what I believe a better answer to this question would be is that we need to run all necessary tests to ensure that the ultrasonic cleaner is performing properly. And we'll see in ANSI Amy ST79 that it states mechanical cleaning equipment performance should be tested each day it is used and all results should be recorded. Another uh, quote that's not on the slide here it says specifically to test for cavitation each day. That's also an SD79. And for the nurses and scrub techs out there, that same verbiage is also in the AORN guidelines. 
but let's talk about more support for running these performance tests when we look at the next slide here. Uh, if you're familiar with Annex D of ST79, it gets a lot more specific about what tests to run in our ultrasonic cleaners. It states to test for cavitation, like we mentioned. It states to test for soil removal from external surfaces. And it also says to test for soil removal of internal surfaces like lumens or cannulated items, things like that. So remember, that better answer to this question is that you should run all necessary tests for each function of your ultrasonic. Some ultrasonics actually perform thermal disinfection. So in all honesty, if you're running your ultrasonic cleaner to also thermally disinfect, you probably should be checking the temperature of that ultrasonic bath water as well. Uh, but let's move on to the next slide and we'll get a better picture of what this really means in real life. Uh, remember, our good question was why run that TOSI test in the sonic cleaner? So we have uh, to ask ourselves, like Seth said in his, because this is all closely related to what Seth's question was as well. Uh, what are we using this machine for? What's the ultrasonic being used for? Is it being used to just clean regular instruments? right? Um, how does that ultrasonic work? It works by way of cavitation or ultrasonic energy. So in this picture, you see in that yellow circle, a TOSI test, right? This came back completely clean after the cycle was ran. So we know that the ultrasonic was able to clean a clinically relevant test soil from a stainless steel instrument. Um, you can see in the red circle going back to that cavitation, right? We want to make sure that there's ultrasonic energy going through our bath. That is a Sonicheck test in that red circle. This is a vial that starts out green in color and in the presence of cavitation or ultrasonic energy, it will turn yellow. So we know that this machine has both adequate cavitation and it's able to clean the external surfaces of instruments. Now, you may have noticed that the contents there in that blue circle is our test for internal surface cleaning ability. So those coupons that are sitting out are normally throughout the uh, test cycle. They're inside those stainless steel cannulas that you see there. And hopefully you can tell pretty easily that the soil is still there. So in this particular case, uh, the ultrasonic lumen flushing slash cleaning uh, function of the ultrasonic was not working. And I can tell you because we ran this test and we looked into what was causing the problem, we found out that the uh, tubing that was supplying all of the flow to those lumens was being kinked when the lid came down on the ultrasonic when we started the cycle. So yes, the cavitation was there. Yes, the toes or the, the external soil was being removed, which is great. Uh, but again, you go back to uh, our, our good answer, which is running each test that makes sense for the function that we want to do, right? We want to run all the necessary tests of our ultrasonic. And in this particular case, we had external soil removal pass. We had a cavitation of uh, an ultrasonic energy test pass, uh, but we did not pass that lumen or internal soil removal test. And therefore we were able to find an answer to the problem and solve it. So that is why we suggest uh, that the best answer again is to run all necessary tests for the function of your ultrasonic. And again, that goes back to any washer or even cart washer, just like Seth had talked about before. And I think we can move on to the next question, which is going to be for John. And this question is, is the level or amount of endoscope point of use treatment pre-cleaning influenced by how long it will be before I can begin manual cleaning and or how far it is to the processing room? Thanks, Kevin. So the bad answer that we put on the screen here is a not uncommon uh, scenario where people say, the processing rooms right next door or right across the hall. So they do whatever they can to shortcut steps along the entire process. So it's understandable and normal for people to want to lessen turnaround time for either a procedure room or turnaround time for a scope. But the very short version of a correct answer is no. Pre-cleaning needs to follow the prescribed steps 
in the IFUs regardless, regardless of how many steps away your processing room is, regardless of whether pro uh, processing occurs within five minutes or 30 minutes, regardless whether it's you yourself or somebody else that's gonna be processing the scope. On this slide, you see uh, example of contents from various IFUs for uh, recent generation endoscopes. Pre-cleaning needs to occur as soon as possible after withdrawal of the scope from the patient. The prescribed steps need to be followed. You see that repeated over and over again. This is the first step of processing, and it's a crucial one. It can positively or negatively affect any of the steps that follow done incorrectly or incompletely. It can make bile burden more difficult to remove and or allow for biofilm development. Next slide, please. So further reinforcement for following pre-cleaning IFUs comes from the national standards and guidelines, examples you see here. We're increasingly referring to this work done at the bedside immediately after the procedure as point of use treatment. It involves tasks other than pre-cleaning itself, such as disconnecting accessories, getting handoff communication ready, preparing appropriate soil transport. The time and distance to further processing do need to be considered for what happens to the scope in the manual cleaning steps that follow. Processing staff need to follow manufacturer prescribed steps for delayed processing in those circumstances where the manufacturer's recommended time between the point of use treatment and manual cleaning is, is exceeded. Uh, next slide, please, Seth. As a further example of the emphasis on following IFU steps meticulously to mitigate risk, the FDA consistently references this in any endoscope-related safety communications they've published over the last several years, as you can see. The other caution that I'll throw out about pre-cleaning, we do site visits around the country to provide observations and feedback towards best practice. I've run into it a few times where people using more current generation olymposcopes aren't using the air water channel cleaning adapter, what a lot of people refer to as the credit card, as per the IFU. They either don't know what it was for or they wrongly assumed it was an optional feature. But that's a required step that prevents, as it says in the IFU, clogging of the air water nozzle. And it can only occur when the endoscope's plugged into the processor in the procedure room. So circling back to the original question, it doesn't matter which staff members involved, how close your processing room is, or how fast the scope gets there. Pre-cleaning steps need to be completed as per the IFUs. Next slide, please. And this is a question for Jahan. The good question is, does the FDA review medical devices prior to being placed in market? Well, thanks, John. Uh, usually we get an answer similar to this, so that all medical devices, regardless of the device classification, are reviewed and approved by FDA. I think the idea of, uh, obviously, we know that FDA is responsible for uh, public health and safety, but all medical devices are not equal. So if you go to the next slide, you will see that at least the, the minimum level FDA classify devices as class one, two, and three. Class one being uh, the least, uh, so, and class three being the most uh, item that they need to look at that. So class ones are usually, they call them exam, and 95% of them, you don't have to do anything, and you do that. So the that question could be, if you want to say all medical devices, you could say that, all medical devices are general control and they are registered with FDA. But as you know, you see the class two, they require some uh, 510K approval and class three, which requires uh, pre-market approval, PMA, which uh, mostly uh, requires some clinical uh, trial and data. So if you go to the next slide, there's a little more detail on that. So as I said, class one are low risk devices and are subject to general control with mostly you need to register with FDA. And these are really from toothbrushes to bandage to anything else. 
and 47% of the medical devices probably that in at least in SPD and stuff could be under this class. So you make a device and you register with FDA, that's it. Class two, they're moderate risk and they required some 510k clearance, which is a lot different. And these are sometimes you say that is uh, predicate uh, to the previous devices and you can just do a 510k clearance. So that accounts between those two for 90% of the devices. So only 10% of the devices are reviewed and approved by FDA. And those are the ones that they require a little more clinical trial, clinical use, and FDA look at those a lot more. And the time and the cost of those obviously a lot different. So the good answer for that is not all medical devices are reviewed by FDA, but all medical devices are registered under the general control with FDA. Next slide, please. So, and a good question for, for Seth is, do I have to test my water quality if planned up facility already performed water testing? I'm sure as you go to the hospital, they said that somebody is doing their job. Why do I need to do that? Isn't that uh, reproduced in the job? Or I, there's an assumption that city water is great that I don't need to do much with it. So what kind of bad answer do you get, Seth? that's kind of it right like oh you know somebody else is testing it you know closer to the to the the main feed line so everything is fine right so we hear that all the time since water's tested close to the source i don't need to test it again and that's that's a terrible answer and and i'll use the uh one quick little anecdote if you've ever seen that water filtration commercial where the guy says would you like uh, a glass of water with an acceptable amount of lead that's not a joke that, you know, the EPA, we've got standards. And so there, there's water things out there where even though it's potable, even though it's considered uh, drinkable water, it still might not be where you want. Um, and But what really gets into this is what happens in your utility right so you're thinking well it is great that somebody in the facilities department is testing the water close to the source. Uh, but water changes significantly as it travels through your through your department. Uh, you know, so if, if your water um, is tested close to where it is supplied by the municipality, it doesn't represent what comes out of your tap in your department. And you can see that picture right there. If it how how many miles and we have miles of pipe running through our facilities, how many miles of pipe that looks like that does it take? for your water quality to change drastically from how great they thought it was when it first came into the building to how it is when you turn the tap on in your department. Now, that top thing, that's probably picking up some minerals. You're probably having hardness issues. Um, there are worse things, actually. We, we don't want that stuff in our water, but you know, on, on the next uh, image down that you see is talking about biofilms. So we can start having things like dead legs and, and stuff like that. And mineral buildup is bad, but what about bacterial, you know, microorganism buildup in the form of biofilms and things like that? And, and that's, you know, that can be a source of, of, of a problem. Sometimes um, units are closed down for renovations, but they don't do any plumbing renovations. And then they bring patients in and a patient takes a shower and then you hear about a Legionella outbreak. The, well, that's because, you know, that water stayed stagnant, the, the chlorination that was in it that came from the, from the municipality has gone way down, that became slack, and it was just a place to start growing things. Um, and, and I do want to make, you know, a little note here, water quality affects more than just cleaning and rinsing of instruments, it, it can become a steam quality issue. And so this happens to be a picture of the bottom of a sterilizer. But if you're if you see that in the bottom of your sterilizer, if you see scaling like that in your in and around your washers, um, if you if you're finding what you hope are hard water stains, um, and hopefully they're hard water stains, not residual protein or blood or something like that. But if you're finding water marks on your instruments, that's really a good sign that there's there's stuff in there, and, and especially if you talk to your facilities department, they go. 
we don't have hard water. What are you talking about? That is a huge indicator that something's happening to your water as it makes its way to you. Uh, and there are very easy, quick, cheap, simple um, dipstick tests and things like that. If you're if you're thinking water quality testing is beyond what you want to do, we're not necessarily talking about taking a sample here and sending it to a lab. Uh, you know, to be analyzed. There are some very easy, quick, simple things that you can do to test water right in your facility, right at your location. And that really is important. So, you know, the good answer is I'm testing it close to where I'm using it. And that's how you know you're going to get the best, uh, the best results and, and really understand the most about your water is, is testing it where you are. Okay, question for Kevin. Uh, how do I ensure that our patients do not get burned by stray electrical current in surgery? All right. So, yeah, here's another good question. Uh, and a bad answer to this question might be just test the insulation of all your laparoscopic instruments between each use. And, you know, this answer does reflect, unfortunately, a lot of current practices out in SPD, which is part of the reason I believe uh, the recent amendments were published, uh, but because some places they don't even test insulation at all, uh, but some places only test their laparoscopic instruments, like is mentioned in the answer here. Um, so you might be asking yourself, you know, why is this a bad answer to this question? Well, again, it's probably not entirely bad. It's just actually an incomplete answer again. So uh, let's move on to that next slide and we'll get a better understanding of why this is incomplete. So a better answer to this question would be that each instrument used with electrical current should be protected, inspected, and tested for insulation and, and integrity. So what does that mean and what's the difference between this answer and the bad answer? So let's go to the next slide and we'll see the amendments to ANSI Amy ST79 that came out earlier this year address this and they state that instruments should be organized and protected from damage. They say that each time a device is processed it should be inspected for cleanliness and integrity and insulation materials should be free of defects. So note here uh, that it talks about organization and protection, which I thought was interesting. It talks about inspection for cleanliness and integrity, and it then mentions insulation material being free of defects. So notice that it didn't say anything about laparoscopic instruments only. Any insulated instrument applies here, or, or even better, any instrument that, that is intended to be used with electrical current, right? So if we go to the next slide, we can get more of an idea of what this really looks like. So here you have a picture in the left corner of a typical laparoscopic tray, right? It's got that laparoscopic instrument caddy and the basic instruments on the bottom. The only problem here is in, I tried to highlight it and pull it out uh, for you with that yellow circle there. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see better on that offset picture to the right. There are insulated laparoscopic instruments in the bottom of this tray. They're not organized, they're not protected, and in fact, they're probably being damaged uh, because of this practice. And so this is an example of how we can do better when it comes to organization and protection. A lot of times uh, think of trays like this and I think, okay, we have instruments in here that cover either a bunch of surgeons ranging from maybe surgeons that no longer work there to maybe, uh, you know, something of a more updated uh, practice in surgery. And maybe we just need to assess what's really being used in our current OR right now, and maybe maybe some of those instruments can come out and you can put uh, the ones that you use in that caddy, keep them protected. But this is just that, it's that example of how we can do better with that organization and protection part. So then in the upper right corner, you have a digital microscope. Uh, in, the, in the picture here, it's just a Kelly clamp, but it could be used to inspect insulated instruments for cleanliness and integrity. And of course you have you know, that insulation tester on the bottom right of the slide there that's great for all various types of instruments that require insulation integrity checks uh, because it has all the accessories that you need. Um, now, 
another important aspect of this is that we're not only concerned with insulation either when it comes to instruments that are used with electrical current. If you go to the next slide, I can show you uh, one more component, well, actually both components uh, that kind of come together with one particular thing. So the new ANSI uh, Amy ST79 amendment states that cables and cords need to be inspected for integrity and continuity. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? So you see that same insulation tester there to the left of the screen, and then we can use the accessory on the upper right of the slide to test the insulation of monopolar, bipolar cautery cords. This is gonna ensure that the cord is free of defects in the insulation. So all that electricity that's going through there uh, should stay within the cord safely as intended uh, should, should you be adopting this practice and testing all your cords. But then on the lower right of your screen, you have the continuity tester. And this is going to help ensure that the electrical wiring inside the insulation is also intact. Uh, because these cords are often reusable and many of them don't even have a, an end of life uh, requirement in the IFU, some do, but many don't. Uh, but there's a possibility that the insulation could be great, but the metal wiring uh, from uh, can be broken from wear and tear. And when this happens, the electrical current that we send through there may have to arc in order to get where it's going. And we don't want that happening inside of our cord because this can cause burning of the insulation. It could potentially cause a spark and a severing of that cautery cord while it's in use. I can tell you if you don't uh, believe this, I have personally worked in the operating room when this happened and it is pretty scary truthfully. Um, the doctor was working on a, on a gallbladder removal case and the cautery cord just sparked and popped and thankfully the doctor didn't jump or anything and didn't cause any harm to the patient. No fire started either, but you could definitely see how we were kind of lucky uh, and it could have been a lot worse. So we obviously needed to prevent this from happening in the first place. And now this is how we can do that. So again, that good or better answer to the question is that each instrument used with electrical current should be protected inspected and tested for insulation integrity, not just laparoscopic instruments. All right, we can move on. So this one is for John and the question is, do I need to further dry an endoscope if the AER has a drying cycle? Thanks, Kevin. So as we were developing this program, I kept having this deja vu feeling that I've been here before, I've dealt with bad answers and it was from being a parent. It's not uncommon when you're talking with your kids and they're giving you their rationale for why they did something. Everybody's doing it. So you follow up their uh, comment with your own question. Well, if everybody's doing such and such, are you going to follow that type of thing? So in this case, the bad answer or the one that we not uncommonly hear is, well, the AER has a drying cycle in it, and we're going to use the scope right away on a patient. So why do we need to do anything more with the scope? So again, it's a good one where I'd start with another question. Have you ever removed a scope from an AER? If the answer is yes, you know that it's still wet. The outside's wet. If you hold it up vertically, water drips out the channel. Despite what many people assume, the cycle in an AER is a purge not a validated drying cycle. It's meant simply to push gross fluids off of and out of the scope. Next slide, please, Seth. So endoscope drying after processings gained increased attention in the last several years, both because of research and clinical investigations that have shown the real reality of residual moisture, especially for channeled endoscopes. It's not been uncommon when we perform our site visits to see scopes hanging in storage, still wet on the outside, and not uncommonly dripping water onto the floor of the scope cabinet. So we really need to change the mindset that these are red flags. Residual moisture allows an environment that's favorable to bacterial proliferation and biofilm development. Where do the current guidelines stand? 
On the screen, you see a few examples here. The multi-society guideline speaks to the need for drying after the completion of all reprocessing steps. This means the exterior as well as the channels. They reference, quote, forced pressure regulated filtered air for at least 10 minutes. SGNA similarly highlights the need for thorough drying before storage or reuse. They emphasize that an endoscope that's not dry must be reprocessed before use. The common thread here is active filtered air drying every time, whether the scope's headed for storage or to the next procedure. Next slide, please, Seth. The rationale behind active drying comes from peer-reviewed research, examples of which you see here. These describe residual moisture for extended periods in storage, days, sometimes weeks, proof of contamination, and infections associated with inadequate drying. So going back to my previous follow-up question, do you really need research to prove to you that scopes are wet coming out of an AER? The answer here is active drying before the scope leaves the processing area, either by active tabletop dryers or the use of active drying cabinets. The mindset for storage and reuse needs to shift to scopes need to be dry first. Next slide, please. And this is back to you, Jahan. The question being, should the device manufacturers validate surgical instruments cleaning process? Yeah, that's, and we, we hear that a lot, the validation. And obviously, the manufacturer of surgical instrument, they believe that all the IFUs have been validated. And especially, they believe there's a, some assumption is that they are validated, their IFU in the clinical setting. So if you go back to the next slide, and uh, we talked about before that, obviously, only 10% of entire medical devices are being approved by FDA. So some of them, for example, the 47% of class one or the class two, they don't have to do a lot, any clinical trial, but let's look at what validate mean. The uh, definition of validate from Merriam Webster is that to attest the truth of validity, removing of doubt by any alternative statement, offering evidence that sustains the contention and establish an actual fact. And moreover, is when you say that validate, I should be able to repeat that any place else. If I validate it in Detroit, then I should be validated in London. So is the whole idea is that the validation, once you come up with those set, it should be validated. If you go to the next slide, We'll see that uh, in the FDA when they're talking about the cleaning IFU, according to FDA, they're looking at these four steps. I'll just go through them. So that a sample of three minimum that you need to select, and you need to contaminate these three additional instruments to serve as a control. So then the instrument must be thoroughly contaminated with the test soil that you have. And then after contamination, the cleaning steps that are listed in the manufacturer IFU must be followed to their conclusion. And after completing the cleaning step listed in the manufacturer IFU, the sample instrument must be tested for residual bio burden and biofilm. So, and then the percentage of reduction of the biofilm should be the validation of test result and should be in a table that, that you can see. So these are the staff for those items that when you submit to FDA that they need to follow it. If you go to the next slide, so then uh, this is obviously pre, this came out like in 2015 and then was updated in 2017. And this is a good document. It's about 40 pages that I recommend that uh, downloading it for free from FDA website. And this really meant to be for reprocessing medical devices in healthcare setting. And then method for, this is a guidance for industry and FDA's uh, administration, the staff that they, they need to follow. If you go to the next slide, you see that in this recommendation, uh, again, this is a recommendation, is not any of those that they need to follow. You said that FDA said that we recommend that you, the manufacturer, 
develop consistent reprocessing instruction across each of your instruments. So if you have a tray of 20 different type of instrument, you should be able to process that entire tray the same approach. You don't need to break it down in five different way of cleaning that. And you should address any known postmark in that. We know that when the medical devices are in, if they haven't been through the clinical trial, those 90% that we talked about, that they could see some issue while they're in the clinical use. And then the manufacturer must really look at that post-market surveillance to see that if those devices, there's an issue with them and they need to address them after that. So selling a device from the manufacturer, that's not the end of it. And for the user facility, that's not the end of it once you buy the device. You need to go back to the manufacturer if you have some of those issues. And then even on those class uh, one devices, which they call, we call uh, control devices, that manufacturers should validate your processing instruction to ensure that it will be followed by average user. So if you go to the next slide. So when we talked about validation, if somebody, a uh, salesperson comes to you and said, are uh, IFUs are validated. This Jim Schneider uh, from Nova Surgical did a great presentation on validation of uh, IFUs. And you need to ask the manufacturer of that, give me a written copy of your validator report that you did send to FDA. Obviously, they may say, you know, there are some of them that are proprietary, but they, they can't show them to you. They may not provide you a copy of it. But this is an example of one of those validation process. And this is done obviously by Nelson Lab, but usually manufacturers like to uh, send those out to the third party that at least is, is a neutral process. So in this, you see that they selected uh, three instruments and they soiled them. And then after that, they, they were all showed negative. So these are the document that manufacturer must submit with their 510k clearance or the PMA approval. So if they have them to FDA, ask for those written IFUs to see that, how did they validate them? And then moreover, if you have an issue that you should be able to you validate them yourself, or if you have a problem and you have a lawsuit or something come up, to send those to a third party and be able to, to validate those. Next slide, please. So is a question for Sad. He said that the good question is, is it acceptable to manually clean an instrument or set that is normally processed through an automated washer? Sad? Thanks, John. We get this all the time. Just, just hand wash it. It's faster, right? Just, just hand wash it. You know, uh, individual instruments, maybe. But I, you know, I mean, if anybody ever brings you an entire set. Uh, and, and says just hand wash it. I I would pump the brakes, right? And so the 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 real good answer is maybe. And I'll say it that way because of the explanation that I'm about to give. Many IFUs do come with manual cleaning instructions, although they may say that automated cleaning is preferred. So there's number you know well, the first thing to think about: Are you you're, you're taking on the responsibility. You're deciding to not use the preferred method. And that right there should make you go, well, okay, I should really consider this. But, but fine, uh, if you, if, as long as you have both, then you know it's an option. If you don't see manual and an automated, you may not have a choice, right? We say to follow the IFU, and if it says uh, mechanical cleaning, or automated cleaning and nothing else, then you just assuming that you scrubbing it in your hand wash sink works, it, it is a bad assumption. So if you're gonna do this, here are the things I want you to consider. Uh, the three biggest things uh, would be, one, is it acceptable per the IFU? And, and as I, this is a Depew synthes, and how many people actually thought, so are we talking about synthes, you know, hip systems and knees? Yeah, they actually do have, um, uh, manual and mechanical cleaning instructions, although I would not be the want to be the person to try to clean my way through an entire Depew hip system manually, but they do have instructions. So the other thing to ask yourself is, 
Or do I have all the needed equipment, brushes, magnification, fluid under pressure, a source of disinfection if that's required? Uh, you know, so there, there are things, um, I'll, I'll use the intuitive IFU as, a, as an example and something that Kevin talked about. Many of us have ultrasonics that, that do flushing and thermal disinfection to make processing those intuitive arms easier. You get to, you get to skip some of the, the flushing and priming uh, steps because the, the ultrasonic does it. So if you're, if you're going backwards to, to manual, if, or if manual process is what you're gonna pick up, do you have all the things that you need? And it may be more uh, than you ex expect maybe more uh, needed equipment than you would expect. And then the question is, do you have the time? Now, why do I say, do you have the time? Well, because I, I want you to take a look here. Uh, well, manual cleaning may be suggested to save time. Probably following all the steps outlined in IFU can take significantly longer than a washer would. So I just want you to know this, this comes from an IFU and I just highlighted the things and they got specific, by the way, equipment, various size soft bristle brushes. Well, I'd like a little more than that. Various size is kind of tough for you. I, I guess you get a menagerie, lint-free cloth, syringes, pipette, or water jet, uh, and then a neutral enzyme to work between seven and nine. There's some, some specific items there. And then, by the way, this would be per instrument, two minutes of rinsing, a minimum of 10 minutes soaking, minimum of two minutes rinsing, manually cleaning for five minutes, a minimum of two minutes with another rinse, visual inspection. When you add this up, 21 minutes per instrument. So if anybody ever says, go ahead real quick and hand wash this for me, you can get that through your washer, the whole set in 21 minutes, as opposed to uh, standing there washing each one for 21 minutes, right? Uh, and then, um, uh, the other thing is, and this goes along with the preferred, and, and like I said, this is a little thing that's actually from the intuitive IFU to talk about some of these steps, prime, soak, flush, for, you know, the reason that we've got um, ultrasonics with pulse flow and, and things like that uh, and, and needing that those lumen testing like Kevin talked about is because that's integral to that a piece of equipment cleaning that device properly. So we invest in this this equipment for its repeatability, for its consistency, and, and for it to help us. And so you should really take a pause before you say, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this very helpful piece of equipment and I'm just gonna do it by hand. There should be a good reason, uh, a good reason for it. And you, you have to know that you're prepared to do it if you're gonna make that choice. Okay, Kevin. Uh, your good question, should the operating room discard the sterile contents of a package if the chemical indicator is not immediately visible? Uh, the integrator was in the bottom of a multi-level tray. Excellent. Thanks, Seth. So this actually was a question that I received from a, a local facility recently because this happened and the operating room decided to use this answer uh, to, to, the, to the problem. And I'm considering it here in this presentation as a bad answer, and I'll explain it further. But their answer was uh, that the integrator must be immediately visible to the user and contents must not be used if the user is unable to see the integrator. Uh, so going on to the next slide, I will uh, try and give you a, a better answer and then we'll get into the explanation. Uh, so I would say, that the better answer uh, to this good question would be to follow the IFU of the integrator, uh, number one. Uh, number two, we want to know and follow our industry standards. Um, and, and the third part of that is that you may need to conduct a risk assessment to clarify your own process and procedure in your current hospital policy because uh, when situations like this come up, usually, and, and in the case of this local facility, it's basically uh, determined by whoever is scrubbed in at the end user uh, level. So in the operating room, they're left to make this decision without the guidance of a policy or procedure because it's not written somewhere. Uh, so if we go into the next slide, I'll discuss it a little bit more detail. So remember, we suggest following the IFU. So what does one common integrator IFU say? It states to, to place it in each pack, 
peel pouch, container system, or tray to be steam sterilized in an area uh, determined to be the least accessible to steam penetration. All right, so that's interesting, but what does the standard say? Uh, when we look at ST79, it states to place one CI visible to the person opening the package and place in an area or areas, so there could be multiple, uh, considered to be least accessible to the steam. And then, of course, in accordance with any applicable IFUs. So now, if we're going to consider all of this, uh, our answer is possibly still a little unclear because, as you can see, the IFU does not say anything about the integrator having to be immediately visible to the user, uh, while the industry standard does. Uh, so this is where that risk assessment comes in. I recommend you look at your current policy and procedure, bring in your OR leadership, the director, infection control, because they're going to need to learn about this, maybe even your chief of surgery as well. Put all of this information out before the group and establish a new policy and procedure based on both the IFU and current standards right? It could really go either way, right, based on this information. So you may want your policy to be that the tray is uh, going to be discarded uh, if and when a CI isn't immediately visible. But you may also want to have that ability to make use of the tray should a CI be found in a more challenging location in the tray, but it wasn't readily visible upon opening. Either case, you could actually make a justi justified reason to go in either direction. But this decision should be made with all the leaders coming together so they can understand what the reasoning is behind that final decision for your policy. And so in this case, I would say don't wait until it happens in your facility. Take all this information to your leadership group, have the discussion, perform that risk assessment, and write an up-to-date policy and procedure for this very scenario. I can guarantee you it will happen because of all those different trauma trays or different tiered trays, uh, you're going to find a, a screw caddy or something that doesn't have a, a an integrator in it, or there's just one that got, got buried in instruments and wasn't immediately visible to uh, the end user. Remember, you have external uh, uh, indicators that told you that the package went through the process, um, and then maybe you find one in a very challenging location. So there's a couple different directions you could go there, but I think if you do that uh, multidisciplinary risk assessment, update your policy procedure, you're going to have a very good answer for, uh, for this when it comes up in your facility. And we can move on to the next slide. And this question's for John. So the question is, we're considering microbial surveillance for flexible endoscopes. Can we consider rapid cleaning monitors like cleaning verification tests? Yep, and the bad answer that we've listed here, Kevin, is we can use cleaning verification tests as part of surveillance testing for our endoscopes. The short answer here is no. Cleaning verification is not the same as microbial surveillance. We run into this uh, not uncommonly where people confuse the two. Next slide, please, Seth. So we have to use products or tests for what they're designed and validated for. Cleaning verification tests, which are also known as rapid cleaning monitors, are to be used following cleaning and before disinfection or sterilization. It's part of focused inspection after manual cleaning. Cleaning verification, as the name implies, is testing for cleaning efficacy. So it's indicating the presence of residual organic soil such that if positive, this allows for the recleaning and retesting of the device prior to disinfection. On the other hand, microbial surveillance testing occurs after processing is complete, after the entire processing cycle is complete. It's used to measure, again, as the name implies, presence or absence of microbial contamination. If positive, in this case, the entire process needs to be evaluated because it, you could have had a gap or an error somewhere along the way from pre-cleaning through cleaning, disinfection, drying, and storage. Anywhere along the way, you could have had a failure point. Again, it's not been uncommon for even clinicians to misinterpret when to use these tests. One uh, more slide here, Seth. 
thanks. So an example of related public confusion occurred about two years ago following an FDA safety communication. In it, the FDA was referencing microbial surveillance for duodenoscopes. As you see on the screen, reference was made to ATP test strip testing as an indicator of live microbes. Why that was problematic and then confusing, ATP testing is not done with test strips, but apparently some companies were promoting use of ATP at the end of processing, meaning after high level disinfection and or as a test for microbial surveillance, which it's not. Further discussions with and clarification from the FDA, they had concerns about claims that were being made. They currently do not clear cleaning verification assays. They do want such products, but they want to see the data that supports the claim. So as a result of this, they reached out to manufacturers of cleaning verification testing and asked for the science behind the claims being made. One more slide. So to recap, commonly used cleaning verification products include both swab and flush testing, and they test for protein, carbohydrate, hemoglobin, or ATP. The correct answer to the what to use for microbial surveillance is either full culturing or shorter duration gram negative testing. Next slide, please. And one more question for you, Jahan. Should a multidisciplinary value analysis or purchasing team include representation from SPD during pre-purchase evaluations? We can't talk about this for a long time, but we're running out of time, so I'll do a quick answer to that. Uh, value analysis and purchasing obviously is becoming really more as a team approach to purchasing. And the answer is that they always perform pre-purchase evaluation and clinical trial that include the professional department. If you go to the next uh, slide, we know that it could be true for uh, some of the instruments. You always go to the OR, there's a lot of nice rooms, roomy areas, tons of different uh, technologies. Then you go on the next slide, you see that SPDs are either removed from operating room, pushed to a corner, or sometimes kicked out of the operating room and sent across the street. So no, they really need to be on the table to see what's going on because that's the important part of that. The cleaning should be part of really pre-purchase evaluation, pre clinical trial or what you go to. And if the manufacturer hasn't done some of those in use uh, cleaning process, this is a good time for them that because you really need collaborate between the healthcare setting and the manufacturer because they, when they make that device, and went through the 510k clearance, they didn't have really access or they couldn't bring it to the hospital, put it in the clinical use. So this is a good time to kind of validate your IFU, verify that if it's working and really be part of that purchasing process. It's important that everybody that has part of that process be part of the, on the table and make sure that uh, they take effect and they have some, their voices are heard. On next slide, we had the three o'clock. So Jennifer, go ahead. Thank you all so much for a fantastic presentation. We do have a few questions to come, that have come in, um, and so we'll take a few of those because we are running out of time. The first question is for Jahan. I am following Amy's standards and other recommendations. Why do I need to use manufacturer IFUs? So one of the things, as we mentioned, that the IFU is really one of the only one that is supposed to be validated. So we look at this, in this case, we said that a validated IFU to be more clear. And that one is important because, for example, the CMS and some of the organization, JCO, they have to go by that because uh, that is a manufacturer, did that manufacturer process, that manufacturer validate based on that IFU. Although sometimes that, you know, those IFUs, if they're not validated, they're not as effective. But then the burden is on you to make sure that you meet and exceed that IFU. So if you have a means of going and say that, yes, the IFU is not correct, I'm supplementing that with other stuff, including the, for example, Amy standard, other stuff, then you have a state, but otherwise that you get in trouble 
especially if you have an issue. When you go to the legal court, the IFU is the one that you need to answer to. Great, thank you so answer. much. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, Seth, John, Kevin, and Jahan for a great presentation. I would like to encourage our uh, audience to visit today's sponsor to learn more about the products and the services that they provide to our industry. Please visit hmark.com. A quick reminder that you can obtain your certificate by completing today's post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed to you one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one continuing education credit, and you'll be able to download your certificate once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, please contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We'll be back soon with another webinar. Please visit ortodaywebinars.live for more details and for complimentary registration. Thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.